I've chosen the story of Jesus healing the leper as today's Bible reading. This man encountered Jesus in dramatic fashion. And I want to ask, do we meet Jesus when we come to church? And more especially, what about visitors to our church? Do they feel they have encountered Jesus? But first I'm going to digress a little and talk about, about Israel. A couple of months ago, my wife Yonju and I spent 16 days in Israel. My father was Jewish and I have relatives there, so we spent time with them. And then we did a 10-day Bible tour, which was a very spiritual experience. It was on the ninth day of the tour, on November the 12th, that my cousin phoned me from Tel Aviv. At the time, Yonju and I were on the tour bus driving near Jerusalem. Martin, I don't want to alarm you, my cousin said, but right now rockets are being fired by a Palestinian group in Gaza and they are raining down on Israel. We've just had air raid, shelt air raid sirens in Tel Aviv and we all had to race to the air raid shelters for a short while. And in the south of the country near Gaza, people can't leave the shelters because of the attacks. She asked me where we were, and I said we were on the outskirts of Jerusalem. You're pretty safe there, she said. On my iPhone, I was able to check the latest news. It turned out that overnight, the Israeli military had killed a Palestinian leader responsible for many terrorist attacks on Israel. So the rockets were a response to that. News reports later that week said that altogether over 450 rockets and mortars were fired at Israel over two days. Many of those heading for centers of population were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome defense system. Some got through and there were some Israeli injuries, though I don't think there were any Israeli deaths. But I can tell you that, there isn't, that there's nothing like being in a bus near Jerusalem when Israel is under rocket attack to get you thinking about Jesus and about the Bible, and possibly also about the book of Revelation and the end times. In fact, earlier in the tour, we had visited the ancient city of Megiddo, which is presumed by many to, the be, to be the place Armageddon, where warring armies will fight before the return of Jesus. So I'm going to speak just a little more about the tour. I know that some people here have been to Israel, and I want to say that I very much recommend it. There's nothing like walking in the steps of Jesus, or of David, or of Abraham for that matter, to help bring the Bible to life. Our particular tour was with a mainly American group, led by an American pastor who's also a Bible scholar and an archeologist. We also had a couple of Israeli guides, and on the first day, one of the guides, an older man with a South African accent, came up to me. He said he had heard I was one of several Australians in the group. I used to live in Melbourne about 25 or 30 years ago, he told me. I replied that I, lived, I live in Melbourne. I used to live in East Doncaster, he said. <laughs> I, I live in East Doncaster, I told him, and I asked him what he'd been doing here. He said that he was one of a group of businessmen from Southern Africa who helped launch Nando's Chicken in Melbourne. So, so as well as treading in the footsteps of Jesus, you also meet interesting people on these tours. Many people are put off from visiting Israel because they regard it as a dangerous country. It's surrounded by enemies, and as we ourselves experienced, they do sometimes attack. But I have to say that we never felt ourselves in any danger at all. At the end of our tour, one of our Israeli guides made a short speech urging us to tell our friends to come and visit. He made a point of highlighting the rocket attacks that had occurred during our tour, and he noted that we had always felt absolutely safe. And I can say that traveling around Israel really did feel very much like traveling around any European country. The Australian Jewish Association recently wrote on its Facebook page, if someone asks if visiting Israel is dangerous, we always answer honestly, yes, it is. The real danger you have to worry about is the food. You'll be exposed to too much good food. <laughs> and I can confirm that the food in Israel is absolutely marvelous. As my cousin told me, no restaurant will survive long for Tel Aviv if it's not serving food of the highest standard. But back to Jerusalem. It's an absolutely fascinating city and five of the 10 days of our tour were spent there. 
Jerusalem is a special city because God lives there. I know that God is in Melbourne and Montreal and Manila and everywhere else, but Jerusalem is different. Psalm 132 says, For the Lord has chosen Zion, which means Jerusalem. He's desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. During our Israel tour, we visited the Mount of Beatitudes beside the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus is believed to have delivered the Sermon on the Mount. It's a grassy hill with space for thousands of people, shaped a little like a natural amphitheater. Our tour leader walked to the bottom of the hill while we all sat near the top. He began reading aloud from the Sermon on the Mount, and we could all hear it perfectly. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus too recognized Jerusalem as God's city. In Matthew 5, he said, But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Jerusalem features in much biblical prophecy. The prophet Isaiah predicted that the Israelites would return from exile to live in Jerusalem. And many Christians believe that the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948 and the complete capture of the city by the, Isra- the complete capture by the Israelis of Jerusalem in 1967 suggest that the return of Jesus may not be far away. On our tour, our guide told us about an interesting prophecy. The Golden Gate, also known as the Eastern Gate, is one of the eight entranceways to Jerusalem, according to the prophet Ezekiel. Then the man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. Thanks to these verses, both Jews and Christians have traditionally believed that the Messiah will enter Jerusalem through the Golden Gate. And because it faces the Mount of Olives, it is almost certainly the gate that Jesus used when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey shortly before his crucifixion. Christians have traditionally believed that when Jesus comes again, he will pass through this gate. But according to our guide, when Muslims conquered Jerusalem, they were aware that both Jews and Christians expect the Messiah to arrive through this gate. And so, perhaps for this reason, they sealed it to stop the Messiah's arrival. And it remains blocked today. It's interesting that Ezekiel, writing more than 1,000 years earlier, had said the gate would remain shut. And one more prophecy. The Feast of Tabernacles is one of the great Jewish feasts decreed by God in the book of Leviticus. It's normally held in October, and the prophet Zechariah wrote, Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship with the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. If the Egyptian people do not go up, they will have no rain. Now each year a large Christian group in Israel called the International Christian Embassy organizes a huge celebration for the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem with thousands of Christians attending from more than 100 countries. This October, just a few months ago, a group of Egyptian Christians came for the very first time and according to a report of the celebration, quote, as they stood on our stage in Jerusalem praying for the nation, it started raining in Egypt. And when they landed back in Cairo, the country was inundated by unusual heavy rains to the point that schools and businesses were closed. Now, I did some online Googling to see, is this report really true? And sure enough, there were reports from Cairo in late October of torrential rain in the city, leading to some flooding and even to some drownings. So I'll leave it to you to decide whether this was a happy answer to Zechariah's prophecy. On our way to Israel, we stopped in Korea for a week to visit Yonju's family. On the Sunday of our stay, I attended a worship service at the Seoul International Baptist Church. This church is part of the American Southern Baptist Convention, and the pastor, Dan Armistead, is from the U.S. 
although the congregation come from many countries and many denominations. It turned out that he was about to leave Korea after 12 years of past, as pastor of the church. And in his sermon, he quite bluntly gave his thoughts on the state of Christianity in the West. In particular, he said he was concerned about the decline of religion in the US and elsewhere. And he has started a new ministry that he calls Church on the Edge. He said this is the description friends back home sometimes used when he told them he was pastoring a church in Korea. He has a website that he started just a few weeks ago titled Church on the Edge. And in particular, he's calling for a return to the values and teachings of Jesus. I was very impressed by what he had to say, so I sent him an email telling him so, and I've had some correspondence with him. At the church service I attended, he spent some time quoting from an article he'd read online and that he thought important titled, Why Millennials Leave the Church. Millennials are those young people aged roughly from their early 20s to the late 30s. And the author of the article, writing about America, though I suspect her words apply here in Australia too, says too many people in that age group have walked out on church by the time they turn 21. And she writes quite bluntly, do we offer more coffee? Do we hire a pastor with more tattoos? Hello, friends. The reason we're staring blankly back is that, frankly, we're insulted. We don't want coffee. We don't want multicolored stage lights. We want Jesus, and we can't find him in your churches. Now, I do have to interject here. There's nothing wrong with coffee in church. I, I happen to know that Josh, our young adults pastor, is a fan of good coffee, and, and I am too. I remember when I was a new Christian here at TBC, our pastor back then, Graham Nielsen, urged me to do some studies at a theological college. People in this area are well educated, he said. If you're going to talk to them about your faith, you need to know what you're talking about. And I think it's something similar with coffee. Here in Melbourne, we have excellent coffee and people know and expect it. So I do think we need to be serving good coffee, not something inferior. But the point is, we should not make a big deal out of it. And on the other hand, we should be making a very big deal out of Jesus. And visitors to TBC should be able to find Jesus in this church. Now, I personally have no doubt that Jesus is here at TBC. I'm, I meet him here. I hope you do too. Many of you will know that one of our sons, Jimmy, died in September. It was, of course, devastating for us. But at the same time, we were absolutely overwhelmed by the love and support we received from this church. People would suddenly arrive at our home with food. I'd always been a bit cynical about the idea of taking food to people when they have problems. But I cannot tell you how much it meant to us, along with the flowers and the cards and the prayers and the many people who came to Jimmy's memorial service. We felt Jesus powerfully in our church. But... Do newcomers or outsiders visiting our church also feel this? I would imagine that many of you have had the experience of visiting a new church for some reason, and you feel very powerfully the presence of Jesus. Or, on the other hand, you just don't feel his presence much at all. You can't quite put your finger on it. You can't quite explain why. It's just a feeling. I think this is probably God's Holy Spirit at work, but when you do feel the presence of Jesus, then if you attend a few more services at that particular church, the chances are that you start to realize that it is a church that believes strongly in prayer, that works strongly at evangelism, and that is also involved strongly in social justice, loving one's neighbor. It is what we sometimes describe as a church on fire. I know we are engaged in all these in our church, prayer, evangelism, and loving our neighbours. But are we a church on fire? Do outsiders feel they are meeting Jesus when they attend our services? What is a meeting with Jesus like? During our Israel tour, we drove through Judea and Samaria, also known nowadays as the West Bank, and we stopped for a couple of hours at the ancient city of Shiloh in Samaria. It's near here that Jesus met the woman at the well, which is featured in John chapter 4. You'll recall the story. It's a very dramatic encounter. It was around noon, and Jesus, weary from his journey, stopped beside a well. A Samaritan woman arrived to draw water, 
and Jesus asked her if he could have some. She was startled that a man, and a Jewish man, should speak to her. Then he tells her that she needs the water of life, and he shows that he knows she has had five husbands. At the end of the story, the woman returns to her town and eagerly tells all the people there that she might have just met the Messiah. I think from this story we learn that an encounter with Jesus will often not be at all what we expect. It might point us to our own sin, and then it could send us out to proclaim his name. This is so dramatic. How wonderful if people coming to our church could encounter Jesus in the same way. In the online article I read from earlier about why millennials leave the church in America, the author continues, We don't want social circles. For generations, the American church was more of a social institution, like a country club, than anything. We don't need that. What we're looking for in religion is an experience so real, so gripping, it knocks us breathless. We want our lives to be overturned. The world is cruel. We battle with fear and hurt on a daily basis. We tread water, desperate for the answer to life. We want something that will finally give us the answer. We crave the divine. We crave something infinitely beyond human. We crave God. Now this author is asking a lot, though I personally don't think she's being unreasonable. I think many visitors to a church feel the presence of Jesus especially strongly when they find that the church is actively involved in reaching out to helping others, loving our neighbours. In our Bible passage, Matthew 8, Matthew chapter 8, we read, When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now in those days, lepers were isolated and excluded from the general communi community, including from their family and friends. They were outcasts. No one touched them for fear of contracting their disease. Jesus' touch may have been the first physical touch this man had received for many years. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to follow him. He is our teacher and guide and model for the way we should live. As the Father sent me, so I sent you, Jesus told his disciples, and that now includes us. We are to be as hands in the world, to reach out to others with love and compassion. It may not mean physical touch, but still we can touch others with kindness and compassion in many other ways. And surely visitors to our church should be able to recognise this about TBC. A couple of weeks ago, our senior pastor Lee spoke on glorifying God as a key principle of Christian revival. And he noted that Christianity grew very strongly in its early days, thanks especially to the work of Christians in loving and caring for women, slaves, orphans, the sick, and others in need. In the words of one commentator, Christians morally and compassionately outlived, outloved, outserved, outcared for, and outhoped the cynical, brutal, and fatalistic pagan world. Unquote. Today, of course, we live in a prosperous country with a relatively generous social welfare system, yet all around we see emptiness and hopelessness, and in many other countries we see poverty and despair. I want to give you an example of our church, TBC, reaching out to help others. And here I've been preempted by what's happened today because we had um, a prayer for Wayne Czech in uh, Ukraine and in a short video clip about him, and I had prepared exactly a short uh, commentary on Wayne Czech. I think I will read what I've written because it complements what we've seen already and I think it, it adds to it. Um, so I'm going to, anyway, tell you a little more about Wayne. I think the clip, in fact, was a little old because it, it said I have three Ukrainian kids, but I do know he has four Ukrainian kids, so, so um, it's certainly at least nine months old. Um, 
Kahalik, what I've written, Kahalik is a small town in Ukraine. It's part of a very poor region of the country with high unemployment and low wages for those able to find jobs. One of the missionaries our church supports, Wayne Czech, lives in Kahalik and is pastor of a church in the town. And he's doing something that to my mind is quite amazing. And I suspect that even in our church, not so many people know about this, even though we are among his biggest supporters. He's developing his own machinery that can transform plastic waste into liquid fuel oil that can be used to power cars and trucks. He has achieved great success with his experiments. And just six weeks ago, in its first major test, one of the units was successful in producing a small amount of liquid fuel. Once completed, it will pro provide unemployment for local people in one of the poorest regions of Europe. It will be a major source of recycling waste plastics. And if it can turn a profit, it might become a source of funds for more social enterprises and for social welfare. It could help transform his town. And incidentally, Wayne has also been involved in delivering aid packages to war zones in Ukraine. And as um, Lee mentioned in his prayer, has even established a cricket ministry with the country's first dedicated cricket pitch in his town of Kahalik. I, co I couldn't find this on the internet, but I've got a feeling that Wayne is captain of the Ukraine cricket team, which um, actually does compete against other Central Europe cricket teams. Our church is a major supporter of Wayne and his work, and I think we all should be celebrating it and be excited by it. And visitors to the church, I hope, will, will come to see that we are reaching out to the world and helping our, neighbor, our neighbors around the world. We support other missionaries who are acting as Jesus to communities in several other countries. Here in Melbourne, our church is actively involved in supporting groups like Link, Love in the Name of Christ, which provides support to local residents in trouble. And many of our church members are also active in other ministries. So Jesus is present in our church. But I sometimes wonder, do visitors feel it? Perhaps we don't engage in enough PR or self-promotion, although I don't think that is the answer. As Pastor Dan Armistead says on his Church on the Edge website, Jesus doesn't need our churches to be in the spotlight. Jesus doesn't need ministries of self-promotion. The crowds sought out and found him in the most desolate places. They still do. Together, we'll discover God's goodness and beauty seen in Jesus, unquote. I suspect that for a church to be on fire, its members too need to be on fire. Are we on fire? A year ago, I delivered a message here at TBC, and I called on our church members to pay attention to six points in order to build our church during 2019. I used a passage from the book of Joel to illustrate this. So I'd like to repeat those uh, points now, as I think they're still very relevant for 2020. If we followed these principles with vigor and passion and with pure and repentant hearts, then we as a church could experience enormous renewal and our visitors would surely feel it. These six points all start with the letter P. The first is priority. We must put God first in our lives, not money, possessions, relationships, television, or even coffee. That means spending time with God in prayer, in Bible study, in worship. It's like a marriage. Husbands and wives need to devote time to each other in order to maintain and strengthen the relationship. And they need to spend lots of time with their children. So too with God. The second point is prayer. I believe we must pray more as a church. Look at any church that is growing, and the chances are you'll find that corporate prayer, regular prayer as a church, is at the heart of all its activities. It's good news that we are starting a regular Sunday evening prayer meeting this year. I believe this is something we should all welcome and something we should all attend. We are God's church. He wants to bless us. I think he might be waiting for us to cry out more to him as a church. So here is our chance. The third P is prepare. Prepare for the return of Jesus. That was certainly one of the things that came to mind when we were driving near Jerusalem and learned that rockets were raining down on Israel. What do I mean prepare? To me, waiting for Jesus should involve a kind of living in the moment state of mind. I mean by that, be conscious with all our senses of what is happening now. It means not dwelling on the past, not being anxious about the future. 
but being joyful about the present. And the fourth P is promise. In the book of Joel, we see the land destroyed by a locust invasion. Yet God promises the Israelites that he'll restore their land and repay them for the years they have lost. We see this again and again in the Old Testament. No matter what trials you are going through, you can rely on God's promises. The fifth P is personal relationship. When we put our faith in Jesus, we receive God's Holy Spirit poured out on us as forecast in the book of Joel. And it is through the Holy Spirit that we develop and nurture our relationship with God. God wants to bless us, and he does so as we develop and strengthen our relationship with him. And so we start to find purpose and meaning in our lives. We find peace and joy, belonging and fulfillment. And that is why it is so important to have a personal relationship with God. It is more difficult for God to act when we're not used to hearing from him or when he is not used to hearing from us. The final P is proclaim. The stark message of Joel was that God is judging us. However, through his grace and thanks to the blood of Jesus, many of us have been saved. But there is still a multitude of people who need to hear the message of Jesus. So, in conclusion, let me repeat what I said last year, updating it by one year. I believe that this is the challenge before us in 2020, to be a church on fire, that God wants us to make him the absolute priority in our lives, to pray like we have never prayed before, to be living in a state of preparedness, of joyful expectancy for Jesus, knowing that he is coming back, to hold fast to God's promises, to strengthen our personal relationship with him, and to proclaim the good news of Jesus to the people around us. So let us all join together, reaching out to God in expectation that 2020 will be a time of great blessing in the life of this church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings in our lives. We thank you for the blood of the cross and the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for this church. We pray that in 2020 we might be the people you would have us be, that we might do what you would have us do, and may you receive all the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.